All right, so I owe you some, some a few more comments and definitions for this picture. Um, so let's say what the type of space is officially. So the type of space um, S. So there are various ways of describing it. One is uh, it's just hyperbolic structures. up to isotopy. So a hyperbolic structure is an atlas of charts to the hyperbolic space. And if you just combine all of those charts, apply a, an isotopy of the surface, you move all the charts around, you get new charts, and you get a new, uh, it looks like a new structure. But if it was just an isotope, you really want to figure it's the same object. So that's, uh, that's one definition. Uh, an equivalent definition is to think of it as all representations from pi 1 of s to PSL 2 r, uh, which are um, which are discrete, have discrete image, and are faithful. Um, so um, this gives you, as we said before, this gives you an actions on hyperbolic plane whose quotient can be identified with s. Um, and then we should mod out by one thing, which is conjugacy dimensions, essentially. And PSL to R. Um, and you can do the same thing as, as also with complex structures here. So all of these things are equivalent definitions of the type of space. You can, you know, you can kind of have a one-to-one -one matching between any of these two. Um, but moreover, there's a natural topology So there's one natural topology on the space which you can, you, there, you can define it in each of these different settings and, and they turn out to be equivalent. Um, maybe I don't really need to say much. I guess if you, it, so to say what the topology on the space is, it suffices to, to say what does it mean to make a small motion? What does a neighborhood of a point mean? So if you start with a, with a hyperbolic structure and then you, uh, so you have a bunch of charts, if you, if you read, if you have new charts which are just kind of close as, point, as maps in the compact open topology, nearby maps to the hyperbolic plane, if all the, if you have, if you have enough, I guess you could say, take the surface, you, you cover it with, say, a finite number of, of chart neighborhoods, and then take the, the charts defined on those neighborhoods and allow each of them to just a little bit, whatever, whatever, whatever structures you may get from that are considered to be close. To, to the one you started with. That's, that's how you define neighborhoods here. Um, uh, where again, you then have to quotient out by the isotope. So, uh, so it's really a quotient space of that. Uh, here, maybe it's a, more, a little bit more uh, kind of concrete to say, for every element of this group, it's a countable group, there's a matrix. So the coefficients of the matrix depend on the elements of the group. If, now if you, if you allow the coefficients to change by a small amount on, on, on enough Pick, pick a, enough elements here to generate the group and now allow the coefficients to change for those elements in, in some way that consistently defines uh, representation, then you get a, a one that's nearby. So this is this just kind of, I guess you could think of this as, if you want, you could think of this as a subset of uh, this, this set of, the kind of set of uh, functions from the group to here. Has, this has a natural topology coming from the topology of this matrix. Uh, and that gives a topology here, so it's just <coughs> changing the structure a little bit. So it has a topology. The two things to say about the topology is, uh, first of all, we know exactly what this is as a topological space. It's, um, it's just a finite dimensional cell whose dimension is given by the complexity of the surface. Um, and you can, um, <coughs> let me not say why this is true, but let me, let me convince you that you could figure out this dimension. Oh, so did Riemann do this? Riemann figured out the dimension. Did he have this? Riemann didn't define the type of space, did he? No, I don't think. It's, is it type of space? I don't want to give anything to type of space. I don't have to give it. Type of space was a little bit after Riemann. Hmm? Type of space was a little bit after Riemann. Type of space was a lot after Riemann, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this, like, this topological identification, actually, I don't know. The dimension is remarkable. That's, that's um, 
The Phil Goldman calls this Fricker Klein space. Fricker Klein space, right. I don't, know, I don't know if either of those people are related to the theorem. Uh, not, I mean, I think this theorem predates them. He, Bill likes to kind of distinguish between the kind of the real analytic version of the space where you have, you have real coordinates and you're looking at uh, real hyperbolic structures with the kind of more complex situation. <coughs> um, okay, so, so I'm not going to give the right credits. Uh, yeah, um, so Bill would call the second thing Fricker Klein space, the first thing that he. Right. Or, yeah. right. You don't have, none of, none of these are conformal, right? They're either hyperbolic or. None of these are. I mean, you, so, oh, you mean I here? Mean, yeah. Both of these are, uh, well, I wrote complex here, so there could have been another line where I, I defined it as complex, and that would be, so the original historical thing was complex. The complex structure was, was Pfeiffer space, and then Bill likes to think of the hyperbolic structure as Fricker, Fricker Klein space. Um, Um, yeah, what did I want to say about the dimension? Um, I mean, there are many ways to convince you that this dimension is right. Let me, let me say just one thing, which, uh, which is not the usual thing people say, but it's one of them. Uh, so just this, just, just imagine that you built, it, built your surface out of the polygons we had in the beginning. <coughs> so just ask yourself how many different ways there are to build such a polygon. So there's a bunch of free parameters and there's a bunch of conditions. So the free parameters are these vertices. So if there's a certain number of vertices, each one can move around in the plane. So that's two dimensions per vertex. Um, so that gives me all the possible polygons that I could ever try to build a surface out of. And then uh, I have some constraints, namely that the length of this one and the length of this one should be equal. That's a condition. The length of this one and this one should be equal. So there's several conditions on edge lengths, and then there's one condition on the angles that I kind of hinted at in the beginning, the angles should add up to 2 pi. So that's another condition. Okay? So you count the number of free parameters and you count the number of conditions. Um, so you should, so you should, if, if everything is kind of right, you should count the number of free parameters, subtract the number of conditions, and then you get a number which is not equal to this. And the reason is that there are two things I didn't account for. One is, um, if I just move this thing by, so, let's, so it's number of vertices minus the number of edges, uh, edge pairs, in this diagram, minus the angle condition, so it's just one, one the angle. And then there's, there's uh, I think, what, what else do you do? Well, if I just move this whole thing by an isometry of the whole hyperbolic plane, Wait, so it should be two times the two two number of edges minus one angle? Because it's the vertex. There's one angle, which is the sum of all of them. Yeah, that I have to get to the vertex. Vertex is two dimensional. Each vertex is two dimensional. Oh, I'm sorry. Two, yeah. two times. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I said that before. Yeah. Two times the number of vertices in this polygon. And an edge pair is also. An edge o. is one condition, right? The length has to be equal. So, right. Okay. I'm not going to actually figure out what the numbers are, because then I would make a mistake. <laughs> do that. But since I've made this mistake before, I can tell you what the mistakes are. So, so I've made all the possible mistakes so far with these three numbers. When you write this down, you will get a number that's too big. It's not equal to this. Why? Two reasons. One is, I forgot to allow for the fact that when I move this thing by rigid motions, I get the same surface. That's, that's the dimension of the isometry group that, that I'm using, which is three. Right? There are three dimensions of isometries of the plane. So I should subtract 3 for the isometries. And then, if I remember my mistakes correctly, you are still off by 2. Anybody want to guess why you're still off by 2? You have a cell structure for your surface coming from this. I have a cell structure. So, so when I glue this up, I have, well, whatever the surface is, I have this vertex and a bunch of loops. Now, I could say the loops. Uh, kind of determined by what's called the marking of the surface, right? Everything is defined only up to isotopy, so I kind of draw one topological picture, and that tells me what loops to have. So that's kind of fixed. I don't have to worry about that. But this point, the location of the vertex in the surface, is actually, it's an actual piece of data that comes out of this thing, right? This, this lands somewhere in the surface. I could have gotten, I could have moved it somewhere else in the surface and moved all the loops along and gotten it. <coughs> so I should subtract two more for the location of the vertex. Okay? And then if you do this 
So I think that that's all the things you have to account for. When you figure them out, you get this. Um, I don't know if that's a good argument. Um, there's probably a better, let me say one more thing. And that, one other thing you could do to kind of get the right notion for the dimension is just to think about how many ways are there to map this group into here. Well, there's two G generators and one relation. Maybe that's a better thing to say. So you do a similar kind of discussion. So there are two, uh, two G generators for this surface group, and then there's a the repeated commutator, which is the one relation you have to satisfy. So each of these can be anywhere in here, so it's 3 times these, that's 6G. And then you subtract one relation, which is 3 in here, that's 6G minus 3. And then, um, and then there's the conjugacy, which is another 3. So that's another way to get 6G minus 6. That one actually gets you the number. Okay, all right, that's enough counting. So, um, and I didn't explain why this is actually a cell and not some other space of this dimension. Okay, so let me not explain that. Uh, but, but the last thing I want to say about... Oh, wait, wait. So then there's this. Right, and then I... I want to um, talk about the, the action of the mapping class group. So again, so we have the mapping class group as defined over there. Um, so this is homeomorphisms up to isotopy, and it acts on the Pythoner space, and that's because, well, the definition makes it clear, right? You can, uh, if you have a structure, you can apply a homeomorphism to all the charts and you get a new structure, you get new charts. So, so, so there's a natural way in which homeomorphisms of the surface act on the charts. And since I'm considering the charts only up to isotopy, then all that should matter is the homeomorphism only up to isotopy. So that's why I get exactly this action on the Teichmann space. Uh, and it turns out to be a kind of nice discrete action. Um, so that the quotient Um, um, is some reasonable space. In fact, this, this quotient, this is just exactly the, the set of hyperbolic structures up to, up to homeomor, up to isometry, essentially. Up to, so if any two, here it was hyperbolic structures up to, up to isotope. If you isotope one to another, you consider them to be uh, distinct, but now if you can map one to another by any map, you consider them to be the same in this quotient space. So this is what's called the Riemann moduli space. Okay, so it's kind of a branch cover actually from the Teichmann space to this to this thing. Okay, so so that's the, the story that we have, and, and a lot of what I there's kind of a lot of uh, things to be gained by studying the geometry of this space and the action of this group and how they interact with each other. And I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm trying to convince you that that's worth looking at. Um, now, the other side of the picture was the foliation. So, so the measured foliation space, let me now write that officially. So this is the space of all measured foliations, as defined before, up to, and I said it, I said it, I'll say it again, isotopy, you can just isotopy this, 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 these charts around, and, and I said whitehead moves, so let me just say what they are. Uh, a whitehead move looks like this. You take, um, if you have two singular points that happen to be joined by a leaf together like this, so um, you, could, um, you could join them together. By, by not quite an isotopy of the surface. Imagine shrinking the length of this common leaf to a point, and you'll get everything else on the surface looks the same, and you get this picture like that. Okay? And of course, you can go back. And you can, if this is one picture, you could do it with more than two points. You can, maybe there's another one, you can join up three of them together, and so on. So that's what I, um, 
those are in both directions, those are called light and those. And the reason I want to identify this picture with this picture, well, if I was interested in the leaf structure of this thing, note that every leaf here can be mapped to a leaf here. There's no, uh, the only thing that happened is that the singular piece here um, got replaced with, with another one. But it has the same kind of rays coming out of it. They go the same places in the surface. So, in some sense, they are the same, in that sense. They also produce the same geodesic laminations. When I replace the foliation with the lamination, I, I kind of I turn these singular regions into polygons. Right? So if you take this singular region and turn it into a polygon, you will get a quadrilateral, right? because it has these four rays coming out of it. And if you take this and you turn it into a polygon, you get the same quadrilateral. So, so when I go from the foliation to the lamination, I forget this, this particular detail of the structure. Okay, so, um, so in this setting, this is the right thing to do. There's other, maybe other settings where you have to be more careful. Uh, I guess John would not think this was the right thing to do. These, these live in different strata of a certain space of structure, the space of quadratic differentials, and so maybe you would not want to identify them. But in our setting, it's the right thing to do, and you get this some space on which we still have an action of the mapping class group, uh, in the obvious way, right? You just act, instead of by isotopy, you act by a homeomorphism. You move around in this space. Now, um, this action is a little more, maybe not quite discrete in the same way, but um, what is there else to say about this? So, the important thing is, so Thurston showed that the measured foliation space is also, first of all, it also has a topology. So, um, why well, don't think a little bit about the topology? But maybe, again, once you have a structure with charts, you can think there are various natural ways to think of the topology on, on the space. So maybe I won't even say it. Um, but if you want to think of it in terms of actions on R trees, you can imagine also what it means to perturb an action on an R tree. Kind of take a part of the R tree and allow it to change. And so on. Okay, so... Um, right, so what is the... So this is a topological space still. And it turns out to be a finite dimensional cell of the same dimension as the vacuum space. And that's not an accident. Um, what can I say about this? I don't think I want to try to explain it since we get stuck on this point. But um, I mean, you might ask yourself, why should it even be a finite dimensional space? It's, looks like a pretty wild space, all these different foliations you can draw on the surface. Um, but um, maybe, maybe you can sort of convince yourself by um, nice way of thinking about it. You, you could well, okay, I'll draw one picture. If you want like a, an image of what, why, where would somehow some kind of a finite dimensional set of parameters come from. Suppose I have one of these, fo one of these foliations. Let, let's draw a little bit of it. So, so there's some kind of picture like this, right? Maybe there's another singular point somewhere. And there's this measure, right? This, this transverse measure that's, that's also part of the picture. So suppose I, I try to, I want to change it somehow. So here's, here's a way to try to change it. Let's, let's first split a little, like we were doing before, split along the singular leaves just a little bit. Just put your finger in here and, and push out a little bit. Like that, and like this. Okay? And now I've got this interesting structure. If, if I chose these red splits uh, the right way, maybe long enough, then I will have cut up the surface into rectangular regions. If you look at what's left, for example, here, uh, this, these, here's a rectangle, right, which is kind of, the green arcs are transverse to the foliation, the red arcs are parallel to the foliation, and you can sort of fill up the entire picture with such rectangles. Here's, here's another rectangle starting here, and it keeps going until it meets another red arc somewhere from my, my picture. So, so I get a kind of so here's what I get. It's called a train track. I get a sort of bunch of rectangles foliated by these green arcs trans transverse to the foliation, and then they fit together along these 
places like this. Um, maybe maybe a typical picture looks like this. There's, there's one of these here, and one of them joins two, and then you know somewhere else there's some picture like this. Are they okay with this? Right. You have to kind of imagine how could this be, right? Like, this all fits together, wrapped around inside the surface, but if you unwrap it, this is what you see. It breaks up into a bunch of rectangles. And then you, you, you look at this and you say, oh, the foliation runs through here, and it gave a kind of, there's the spacing between the leaves of the foliation. So, so the spacing between leaves gives a number to each of these green arcs. So there's some kind of a, a, a weight, maybe W1 here, and maybe W2 here. And it's the same for the entire rectangle, because these are parallel leaves of the foliation. But when they... When you come into here, you have two different rectangles, and they come and join into a bigger rectangle. The total amount of weight given to these is, some, uh, is the sum of the previous two weights. So this foliation somehow determines a bunch of weights on this combinatorial diagram. And then you could ask yourself, well, could I change the weights? What if I change the weights? I could, what if I chose a different bunch of positive real numbers here? which satisfy these conditions, that, that the sum of these, of, of these two should be equal to the third, and so on, in every place where it matters. Then, um, then I would get some kind of, well, it would be some other bunch of numbers, but then you could, you could build the foliation associated with those numbers. It would be like, like rescaling this picture, making this one a little wider, this is narrower, and then you join them up, and, and then you follow the leaves, and you see what they do. They do something new. They, didn't, they, they topologically do something else. Um, Maybe it's worth drawing one complete picture that comes up in the function torus. So, so here, here's one actual complete picture. You have uh, one rectangle that looks like this, and another here that goes up and then comes around the back of the board and up this way. Sorry. Right, so this, this one attaches to this one. And then finally I want uh, this. Maybe I'll join them together in one, which will come back here. Right, so this connects to this. There's a complete picture, right? Like three rectangles, right? All attached together. This turns out to fill up a, a one whole torus. And, uh, and now, if I if I change the if I choose weights here, w1, w2, w3, then what foliation I get depends on the weights. If I start here at some on some leaf, then I I land here at this height of W2, but then when I come back around, uh, where am I? Right, when I come back around at height, whatever this height was, T, I come back at height T here, but now when I, when I come back around, now the thing I meet is not the original W2, but the W1 over here. So where I go here depends somehow on T and on the difference between W2 and W1 or something. So. So where I go next depends on the numbers. And then I come back here, and then I'll come back here, and then I'll come back over here. So the pattern in which this leaf travels depends on the numbers. So it's certainly true that if I, if I vary this picture, I will get a family of, of foliations supporting these rectangles. And they will come back and give me a foliation over here. Um, and so now you can imagine that by looking at the possible ways of embedding these train tracks in the surface, you could, you could do some kind of order vector to computation and come up with the right dimension for this, for this space. Okay. So that, that's like a one minute argument why you should expect this to at least be a finite dimensional space. Okay? All right. And then the, the last thing I want to say about this um, uh, about this theorem um, so now we so, so we now know something about these two spaces, and moreover, this thing that, so now MF of S is this, uh, this space, R6G minus 6, and actually it's set up, you can set this up so that um, rescaling the measures, so scaling here means you just take all the measures of between all the leaves and multiply them by a positive real number, that's the scaling. And that gives you a kind of a ray structure on on this space, and that ray structure can be made compatible with this coordinate chart. So, so we're just kind of rescaling rays in R6G minus 6, which means that this, 
projected by space is just, well, I guess it should subtract the zero. There's kind of an empty foliation that I didn't, that I didn't mention, that, that you should have in order for that to be the picture. If you subtract away the empty foliation and rescale, you get the sphere of direction. So this is just a sphere of dimension 6g minus 7, which is all set up to be the boundary of the ball of dimension 6g minus 6. So this thing, so what we're really saying here is that Ts union, PM, uh, union, union PMF can be identified with R, R 6g minus 6 uh, union, the sphere, the boundary sphere, in a way that makes it homeomorphic to the ball, the closed ball of radius 6g minus 7, and the whole thing comes with an action of the mapping class group. What? What's six? Oh, this, I'm sorry, this is six. Yes. That's six. Okay, so this, this is Thurston's compactification of the Teichmann space. It's, it's, um, it's, it's more precise than, than what I said before, right? The, 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 the archery discussion might have led you to expect to see some kind of compactification of this. The historical order was the opposite. So Thurston proved this theorem in, in a different way, which I'm not going to discuss, a more, a more you can, as you can imagine, a way that's more compatible with these sort of pictures, because that kind of comes from, from those ideas. Um, um, so I will talk about that. But then the, the kind of the archery uh, interpretation of this reproves part of this theorem, not the entire, not this final structure here. But, um, uh, and, and of course, the archery picture generalizes to other representations of other groups, and so it's also, it has its own value independently. Okay, so, um, so how far, what else am I trying to do here? So, um, okay, so we're, we're still kind of introducing ourselves to this story. So let me, let me also say something about, uh, I want to say something about uh, what the mapping class group action is like. So now I have this was kind of Thurston's motivation for understanding this, was to kind of understand in a more coherent way how does the mapping class group actually act on all this? What does it look like? Um, and so let me quickly say what that looks like. Um, so, so this is also a theorem of Thurston. Um, so let F be an element of the mapping class group. S, then one of the following holds, uh, one of these holds. Uh, it could be elliptic, let's just call this the elliptic case. So F has some power which is isotopic to the identity, and F fixes uh, a point in the Teichmann space, and hence acts by isometry, so it acts by isometries on some hyperbolic surface. So you can imagine a hyperbolic surface with some symmetry. That's well. Uh, so maybe, uh, so here's a hyperbolic surface. If you choose the hyperbolic metric nice and symmetric here, you can imagine a kind of a Z, a Z mod 3 rotation, which is isometric. And that would be an example of a finite order mapping class on the surface. Okay. I should maybe, uh, it's kind of a uh, generalization that's called the Nielsen realization theorem, I should mention. Um, uh, every um, finite subgroup of the mapping class group fixes the point. So this is the theorem of Kirchhoff. Um, so this was for kind of a cyclic group, an, a, a, an order, a finite order element. But in fact, there are many finite order subgroups, finite subgroups of this group, and each of them fixes a point in the Teichmann space. So there's kind of a nice um, picture of that. So, um, all right, that's the elliptic case. There's uh, what's called the reducible case. So maybe F 
preserves uh, some multi curve. Let's see, so imagine that. Imagine that uh, there's some, maybe in this case, here's a multiple, C1 and C2. Maybe there's a map that, that preserves these, these two loops. Either it interchanges them or it preserves each of them separately. And it does something in the complement, maybe something complicated in the complement. So that's called a reducible map because you can imagine that this being the start of kind of an inductive discussion, right? Once you preserve these two curves, you, you, if you cut along the curves, you preserve the complementary subsurfaces, and then you have a mapping class in each of those, and you can study that. So it's a reduction step. And then the third one, the, the kind of more, most exciting one, is uh, what's called uh, irreducible, or but in particular what's called pseudo Anosov. Um, and then I should draw the picture of this heat. F here preserves um, a pair of transverse measured foliations. So, um, and, and more, but more than just preserve them. Um, so on the surface, the way it looks is this. You have, let, let, let me just draw kind of so here is a measured foliation of the type we had before floating around in my surface, and presumably quite complicated. And then uh, and here's another one that's transverse to it. Okay. Um, and then what I want F to do, uh, let me draw it. Actually, let me draw the image in the same picture. Okay. So F somehow. preserves this picture in the surface. And if it preserves the foliation, it, well, first of all, it has to preserve the singular points, or at least permute the singular points. And when I say preserve the foliation, I don't quite mean that it preserves it point-wise, because then it would just be the identity. I mean that it takes leaves of the foliation to leaves of the foliation. So what I want to say here is this. I'm going to say, let me draw the, the image of a, of, of a polygon in this picture. Let me draw, okay, I'm, running, I'm using the colors back here. Take like this hexagon around. Suppose I take F. Suppose for my example that F fixes this red point, and it preserves both the, the white leaves of the hexagon and the green leaves. But it, uh, what, what else can it do in this picture? It, it can bring some of the leaves together. So, for, so what I want to draw is this: that, that it, it brings the white leaves toward the singularity. So maybe this white leaf goes to this white leaf. I'm going to draw it red though, and it spreads out the green leaves. So it looks like this. Very okay with this picture. So, so there's some homeomorphism that's globally defined on the surface, but what it does, it does this thing. It's like a hyperbolic map, right? Like, like um, for for any non-singular point, it's it's moving it say from here over here, and it collapse, it contracts one direction and expands another direction. So, uh, without the singularities, this would be called an Anosov map. It's an idea from dynamics, and you can imagine once you have this, it's going to be dynamically very complicated because. Once you have this picture, if it's happening kind of on the whole surface, then things get exponentially blown up in one direction, exponentially compressed in the other direction, and so the kind of it's kind of a mixing uh, dynamical phenomenon, and that's what that's what F does. And um, if you think a little more carefully, you see you see that on the the, the foliations are preserved leafwise, but the measure is changed. I've taken leaves that are this far apart and moved them to be this far apart. So depending on how you think about whether you're going forward or backward. It's multiplying the measure on one foliation by some multiplier, and it's dividing it on the other one. So it's actually taking, so F, there's two foliations here, we'll call them mu plus and mu minus, and F of mu plus is lambda mu plus for some lambda greater than one, and F of mu minus is one over lambda mu minus. We're somehow stretching and shrinking in this way. Um, so that's what a pseudo also does, and, and once you kind of study this, you realize that, for example, it doesn't preserve 
now you cannot preserve any multi-curves. It takes any curve in the surface and kind of stretches it ultimately uh, to get more and more like the, the, the foliation which is getting uh, longer. Okay, so uh, so what is in fact so one last picture to associate with this is, is what 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 does the action on the compactification look like? So on Teichmuller space union PML PML. So the elliptic was not so bad. You, you can sort of imagine what the elliptic does. There's a fixed point somewhere, and it's kind of acting as a, some kind of rotation. It's an, the transformation of the space, which um, it might actually have some fixed points here too, just like rotations of the of the ball. Regular rotations might have some fixed points. Um, but it has at least one fixed point somewhere in the interior. Uh, the reducible. It's a little not clear what the reducible is doing. It, it at least has some. Um, so the curves, the multi-curve that's being uh, fixed, you can actually, I didn't say this, maybe I should have. Maybe I'll come back to this. The multi-curve can be thought of as a, as a measured foliation also. You can think of the leaves, the multi-curve, as spilling out a, a foliation on, on the surface. So it kind of embeds in a natural way as a point or a, or a simplex, it's several points, in this um, space of measured foliation. That is a pair of transverse, well, they're not really transverse measured foliations then, they're partially defined or something. Yeah, just, they're not, they're not transverse. Then they wouldn't be transverse, right? If there's a whole part of the surface that, that they get squashed in, they end up having parallelism on the leaves there. Okay. So I think, I think I'm probably formally speaking okay. Um, okay. So there's th this irreducible picture. Is, is, I'm not going to try to draw it. Something happens inside. There's no fixed points inside, uh, and, and there's a kind of a, a single little cluster of fixed points, the infinity, a little simplex associated with that multi-curve. Uh, and it's, you have to think about what happens in the rest. So there's some kind of picture like this, which you should think of as reminding you of a parabolic transformation of hyperbolic space. And then the, the last one is the, the Sudarnasov, in which um, there are two points, mu plus and mu minus, um, where, which are fixed by foliation, but, but they're fixed in this way, that, that they're, they're fixed projectively, they're just multiplied. So as points in the projective space, they're fixed. Uh, but but in, in actual, in MF, they're actually expanded or contracted. And, and what that means, it turns out, what that means in, for the rest of the sphere is that everything gets attracted by this one and repelled from that one. So there's this kind of dynamical structure where F somehow, and also the same thing is true in the, in the interior. Every point in the space except for the two fixed points is, is pushed toward the positive fixed points in positive time and toward, and if you apply the inverse map, it gets pushed toward the negative. So that's called that's what's called north-south dynamics. So, okay. So now um, we kind of have this is kind of the, the picture, I guess, as of I don't know, 1979. Is that where we have to 1979? Well, maybe if you include our trees, then it's up to sometime in the 80s. Um, yeah. So in this particular case, you've excluded the case of the torus. I but have, torus, you, you've but excluded it, it not because it's it. uninteresting, but because you think we know it already, right? I mean, right, right. Okay. That's, well, do I think you know it? Do I? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah, so that's true. Right, there's, there's a it part of this discussion. It is interesting. The case yeah, the torus. case of torus is interesting and it motivates everything else. Well, it, case, I think it motivated Thurston also. Sure. He was trying to re reproduce the case of the torus. That's right. Maybe, so I, yeah. So I, I kept, when I was preparing this, I kept wondering whether I should spend the 15 minutes I would need to talk about the torus. And I shouldn't, but I should at least say if S is the torus, the mapping class group. Can everybody see this? No. Sorry. So I'll just say what you want me to say. Um, if, S, if S is the torus, the mapping class group uh, is just the automorphism group of the fundamental group of the torus, also known as SL2Z. OK? 
Okay, and a Teichner space um, just turns out to be the hyperbolic plane. This is kind of one of those weird things where the same object shows up in two different costumes. So Teichner space is the hyperbolic plane. This is the action, the same obvious action as before, but now it's it's ha acting on the parameter space for tori. You're sort of saying the God of Mathematics can't afford enough actors. No, he's just the easier. <laughs> he's on strike. That's why he's saying stuff like this. <laughs> the, the god of mathematics is a poet, so he likes things to recur and rhyme. Um, or she. Um, right, so, and then, and then there's this kind of classification in SL2Z of exactly this type. So elliptic corresponds to two-way two matrices that act as rotations. And uh, this one, the reducible, is parabolic. So for example, so maybe, uh, yeah, so par uh, what's an example of an elliptic one? I guess 0, 1, negative 1, 0, I think, is the rotation by 5 over 2. Uh, that's elliptic, and then parabolic looks like this. Um, and, and kind of the generic thing, in some sense, is the hyperbolic case, which is, well, almost anything else, so I don't know, 1, 2, 1, 1, I think. Um, so, so kind of anything, anything other than this kind, th this has two eigenvalues of opposite, you know, whose, whose, eigen, whose product is 1. Can you swap the 2 and the 1? Can I swap the 2 and the 1? Maybe yeah. like that. Then it's symmetric. I don't like to make it symmetric. But you're right, then at least that it has positive determinants. If you like that, well, can I do this? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, nice. <laughs> anyway, such a thing acts on a plane um, as a as a hyperbolic map. It expands and contracts. So that's what it does to the torus. And the torus so, is a pair of foliations, which exactly fits this picture, but without a singularity. So in dynamical systems, we say two, one, one, one. Two one, one like this. Two one one one. Yes, we oh, yeah. but that's still yeah. symmetric. I, I don't like to make them symmetric because it, it feels well. It's better than having trace zero. Which your your third example is trace zero. Oh, that's not good. No, so sorry. Two one, 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 one. one one. No, no, but I was trying. Okay, fine. Two, one, one. You're right. But the thing with two one 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 is that it's symmetric, which means the foliations are orthogonal, which which is a little bit of an accident. So three two one one. Three. No, we should stop, not, right? No, <laughs> okay, three, two, that's, one, one. That's, that's not symmetric, and it is. That's not symmetric, and it's still hyperbolic. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Um. Okay. So and maybe we'll refer to the torus case again later. Um. How long do I have to five up? How, what's the usual? Uh, yeah, you could go. You could go to five. Yeah, I can go to you know, I can go to six thirty. <laughs> <laughs> you could say something for tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, four time. Uh, what did I want to say? <laughs> so to four. Four. What? Go to four. Go to four. I said five. Four. Oh, I see. You said okay. I thought five minutes, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Right, so, so what are we going to do with it? So we have, um, ah, right, so I didn't yet talk about the metric on this whole picture, and I kind of need to. Ah, okay, so, um, yeah, I have to, because actually my, my goal in the end is to say more about the geometry of the Teichner space, so I have to tell you what the metric is, so that maybe, that's what I should do for the next hour and ten minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, so metric. So I want to um, put a metric on the Teichner space. Um, and actually, you saw one now that I have the torus up there. Uh, this one, of course, has a natural metric. Namely, you give it the hyperbolic metric, and the magnet class would act by isometry. So that's a good thing to do, to have. So. Um, so that motivates us to ask for a nat natural metric on Teichner space, which should be invariant by the mapping class action. Um, uh, so there's more than one. There's not a canonical one. 
Uh, but there are various ones that are worth talking about. And so I want to spend a minute talking about the Teichmuller metric. Uh, first, so, and then we'll do, we'll, we'll talk about a different metric, the Bay Peterson metric. Um, I think we'll talk about it tomorrow. So, um, the idea is that, that um, you, should, you should try to quantitatively see how, how far two structures are apart. And we stop. And we have, what? A couple more minutes, but actually, it, it, I think they may have the room. Well, they have the room in five minutes. Okay. For, yeah. Two more minutes. Okay, so. Two more, two more minutes. All right. So maybe, so we'll really have to do this next time, I guess. Um, What do I want to say? So let, let me say it in, in, in bullet points. So I, wanted, I, I need to use the complex structure definition for this, for this notion of metric. And the idea is that it measures quasi-conformal distortion. Um, so if you have two, K, you have two hyperbolic structures, X and Y, on the same surface, you might try to ask, they're, they're different complex structures, so that means that any map between them is not holomorphic, not conformal. How can you measure how not conformal it is? And the answer is that you measure, uh, so we'll just draw a picture. So if, uh, if you have a conformal map, say H, between two complex surfaces, if you look at DH, it acts on the tangent space. Here's the tangent space. It takes a circle uh, to a circle. Right? Circles go to circles if you have a conformal map. That's what conformal map is. Derivative takes circles to circles. If it's not conformal, then a circle will go to an ellipse. Right? That's what linear maps do. So uh, if it goes to an ellipse, you can measure the eccentricity. You can, in fact, specifically, you measure the major axis divided by the minor axis. This, let's call this M, capital M, little m, and K is capital M over little m. And maybe it's worth observing that if you look at, if you have two, if you have say a map from x to y in f, and a map from y to z, g, then uh, k of g f at any point uh, is equal to k of g times k of f. So this is this is a pointwise thing, right? So I'm, I'm since I have less than a minute, pick a point on the surface and just do this kind of chain. Use the chain rule here between the tangent spaces. And you see a circle goes to an ellipse, an ellipse goes to another ellipse, but the the, these kind of ratios multiply. So, um, so now you define uh, k of x, y to be the infimum over all maps from x to y that are isotopic to the identity, because we're all on the same surface. Uh, of uh, each one, you take the soup over all points in the surface of k of f, um, and that gives you some kind of a number which, which measures how far apart x and y are. You look at the worst distortion, and you try to make it as good as you can by choosing a good map. Okay? And then it turns out that this has a submultiplicative prop property here, so that means that log of k satisfies the triangle inequality. So it produces a metric on the space uh, just because of this. Uh, and then if you go back and do this for the Torah, you will get back exactly this metric. So maybe that's enough for, for now. We'll come back. I want to talk about what geodesics look like with respect to this metric and then start to relate all this to the properties of that.